I just want to stop and take a moment uh, here this evening. This is, a, this is a really big deal. And I really appreciate, we all do, those of you who are sitting out there in the audience and for those of you who are online. We have seen in the past the power that business brands and leaders and platforms can bring to change that transformative power. And I just want to say we are on one of the most influential platforms in the world. And we have some of the most influential leaders and brands here. For the very first conversation of this type in history, where disability business inclusion <coughs> is on a main stage of such a platform with such influence around brand and leadership which is critical. I also want to acknowledge the commitment of Procter & Gamble and Unilever, competitors on this stage, no seriously recognizing the scale of the problem that exists. Because actually, tackling inclusion is not about competition, but it's about collaboration. And this is a really big deal, and we very, very much appreciate it. And I want to acknowledge the World Economic Forum. Thank you. So, disability is a very personal issue. Um, every single one of us is going to touch disability at some point in our lives, experience it. I mean, that's just the law. Um, I can imagine every one of us knows somebody with a disability. But it's very personal to me. Um, I am registered legally blind, severely visually impaired. Um, and that's why I'm sitting in the middle, so I have some chance of seeing somebody. Um, if the timing goes off, that's because I just can't see it. And plus, I'm Irish and I most likely will ignore it. I talk too much. Um, but I, this is a very personal issue. I am part of a tribe of 1.3 billion people in the world. I want to set you the context of which we are talking about today. As 1.3 billion represents one in seven of us, 15 to 20% of our global population. 80% of that 1.3 billion acquires the disability between the ages of 18 and 64. That's the workforce age. 80% of those disabilities are invisible. You are 50% more likely to experience poverty. You are 50% less likely to have a job. Disability, collectively, is the most marginalized group of people in the world, despite the fact it touches all of our lives. The ILO have estimated the cost to disability exclusion in the OECD countries is 7%. That's extraordinary. UNICEF just announced that 90% of children with a disability do not get an education. So this is a crisis. But there is a solution. And that's why we're here. Business is the most powerful force on this planet. If business includes people with disabilities and their families, so will society. Every person who has a disability has at least two people that love them, I hope. Which means that we're talking about 53% of our global population. If business recognizes that value, society will. Inclusive business will create inclusive society. We have seen this so many times before when business pushes in and uses its energy and its influence. But why is it not with disability so far? Well, because disability has been on the sidelines of disability for quite a long time. There are examples of excellence, but it has been. And a lot of this has got to do with, there's a lack of comfort about great business leaders. There's, there's a lack of confidence for them to come up and speak about it. And so I want to acknowledge our five here today. EY did a report saying 56% of board members had never or very rarely had disability on the board agenda. The second reason that we know is, is the reason that we're on the edges is this competing disability and inclusion agenda, the craziness of this hierarchy of exclusion. And one year we'll do LGBTQ and the next year we'll do race. And this is causing huge issues because there's a finite amount of resources. Why are we competing agendas against the other when we're talking about inclusion? And we have a statistic about this. 90% of the companies in the world 
prioritize diversity, but only 4% include disability. It's crazy. And then very lastly, I think the issue that we're here to speak about today is there is a very clear economic case and a return on investment for business. It's already proven because of all the issues that have gone before. And it's about brand differentiation. It's about next generation talent and acquisition. It's about a market the size of 8 trillion. And that's before we add in the aging workforce and that is annually. This is a 20% of our global population. Business would be crazy not to engage with it. But there are serious social consequences when it doesn't. So the panel here today we're here to try and learn from all the great work that was done before, whether it was gender or sustainability or climate change. Will you teach us? What can we do to see the next wave of change, to deal with this, this final frontier of inclusion? How can we learn from case studies like your own companies of excellence so we can scale them and bring systems change so we see disability as part of the strategy and cultures of our organizations? Teach us. I think people seem to miss out that we need the same energy from you leaders and passion and excitement and motivation and engagement that we have committed to climate change and to gender and other socioeconomic issues. And so the very first part of all of this is if we don't talk about it, we don't go anywhere. So today we're going to have that very first conversation. And I could not be more delighted to have this extraordinary panel very first five leaders to stand on the stage to talk about it. And I'm going to ask each and every one of them just to introduce themselves and give us a head heart reason why they chose to be on this panel. And I am going to look to Paul Pullman first. That's and good. you've got to do a quick, you get two minutes. That's not everyone. <laughs> anyway, the reason I'm here is exactly why you need more people uh, to, to have that on their personal agenda. We're here this week. Um, to talk about, again, the Sustainable Development Goals. It's very clear that we're living in a period of time that we're being stressed by many challenges, because one's probably climate change and inequality. Uh, most of the goals of the Sustainable Development Goals were falling behind. The overall goal is very simply not leaving anybody behind. Uh, we put it in, in many parts of the Sustainable Development Goals. I, I had the pleasure of being on the high-level panel to prepare them. Uh, be it on the goal of education or accessible cities or inclusive societies, uh, inclusive institutions, goal number 16 and many other things, we deliberately put the rights in for everybody, including for people with what I call disabilities. And we just have a long way to go if you listen to these statistics that uh, Caroline shared with us. And it's very simple. If we don't have a world where everybody is included, then we're touching the basic fabric of humanity and we have to watch that because it threatens our own existence if you want to. So I run a blind foundation with my wife. We have 25,000 blind children in school in Africa that we support, but less than 10% of the children go to school. And frankly, you just have to ask yourself a very simple question. It could have been you or it could have been your child. So not leaving anybody behind is a starting point for me for the issue of disability, for mental health, for uh, LGBT, and, uh, and uh, any other, and we should fight once more any time that is being threatened, especially now by some of the politicians that think that it can be summarized in a simple tweet. Thank you. All said. <coughs> <coughs> okay. Julie, I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna okay. follow the row. Tell us a head heart reason why you chose to sit on this panel. Sure, so I'm Julie Sweet. I'm the North American CEO for Accenture. And you know, at Accenture, we really believe that our commitment to diversity and a culture of equality has been a source of incredible innovation and creativity. And we see the financial benefits, we see the benefits in attracting great talent. But a few years ago, we really started seeing that we didn't think we were focusing enough on disability. And I remember our first webcast that focused on invisible disability. And after the webcast, a woman I had known for six years, a managing director, very senior, she came to me and she said, almost in tears, thank you for doing that website, that webcast. 
I suffer from severe depression. And, you know, I've never told you that, even though we'd had, you know, we were friends. And this is the first time I felt comfortable talking about something that at times is debilitating. And in that one moment as a leader, and I think personally inclusion and diversity is always about a lot of learning over the last several years, but in that one moment I recognized why it was really important that we start focusing more. And I also remembered that even though this is about a clear business case, we are an innovation-led company, you cannot have innovation without diversity, it's also about individuals, right, the human element. And um, that was very special for me. And then I have a personal connection because, and I know it's probably two minutes, but I'm going to take one more minute. Yeah, go ahead. Because I don't, I think, I think you can become engaged in disability um, inclusion from lots of different angles. And when I was a freshman in college, I'm dating myself in 1985, I did my first volunteer work, well, at least the first volunteer work that my parents hadn't chosen, because <clears throat> I did a lot when I was growing up. And it so happened to be, very randomly, that it was an organization near my college that served uh, teenagers with mental disabilities. And you know, I was completely new to the area. And I loved working there. I got so much more out of it than I gave. But what made me really sad, and this was in 1985, is that all of these teenagers were about to age out of the school system. And they had nothing to look forward to. They were going to live in group homes. There were no jobs. And it was just, it was so sad to me. And I feel like I've come full circle now to be at a company where we really believe in providing opportunities for individuals, including individuals with the kinds of disabilities of these teenagers. And three years ago, I became our executive sponsor at the new relationship that we formed with the Marriott Foundation's Bridges from School to Work that served students in high school just like those I had helped. And I really felt, you know, life works wonderfully. And it was so incredible to see the change from 1985. So I'm feel really privileged to be a part you know, of this. And I think it's great that what the WEF has done, and it's also great that our Accenture alum, Caroline, yeah, I know. 17 it's, years of incredible it's dedication really exciting. to this. It feels so, like it's closing the circle, right? Yeah, it's really special. So thank you for having us. And we feel privileged to be a part oh, of it. It's fabulous. Um, I'm going to go to you, Duncan. Uh, give us a head heart reason you're here. OK, so I'm a business person. So let me talk from the head first, which is our customers are going through profound change, much of it driven by technology. And our role is to help our customers thrive in a digital world. To do that, we need outstanding talent in our company. Okay. It means we have to take diversity and inclusion really seriously, and disability plays a huge role in that for us. Okay. When you put great teams together like that, you enable companies to make breakthroughs like we've done with the Royal Bank of Scotland and NatWest, uh, using quantum computing technology with great people to manage 120 billion pounds of assets, their high quality liquid assets business. That's what you can do if you get this right. Now, the hard part is my dad lost his sight when he's his late, late 50s. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, kind of made me realize two things. One is what massive adjustments he had to make. Yeah. And the other thing was how completely inept I was at being able to help him. You know, I've left him in the middle of cities on his own. I, you know, I've gone five minutes. And where is he? <laughs> that I could relate to. Where, 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 uh, why, why didn't you follow me? Well, because I couldn't follow you. So it brings it really into focus about what you need to do and how important it is to make adjustments for people. Thank you. Um, Peter. Caroline. Give us a head heart reason why you chose to sit here. Yeah, so I have a couple, but I'll do one very briefly. Uh, this was July 4th, which, which as you know, I'm, I'm an American. My name is Peter Grauer. I'm executive chairman of Bloomberg. Uh, and it was the July 4th, and I was at a friend's barbecue in the afternoon. <clears throat> and a friend uh, brought over their daughter and introduced her to me. And I was a little bit put off by the discussion that we had because she didn't look into my eyes. She looked over my head. And we finished a very nice conversation. And I had a subsequent conversation with her uncle. Uh, and I said, uh, what's the matter with your niece? 
and he said, she's legally blind. And she has been since she was age nine. And she's gone through a high school and gotten the best grades and went to Barnard College. And uh, she was interested in an internship job. And we gave her an internship job. Anyhow, to make a long story short, she is now one of the rock stars that we have in our human resources group. And she has taken each additional responsibility with a level of commitment and uh, dedication that I wish all of our colleagues had because she sees this disability as something that gives her, in, in many cases, almost an extra competitive edge to do the job better than anyone else. And, and I think she has the potential at some stage to run our human resources group and maybe even do broader things uh, in our company. And has really kind of set the bar very high for, for me as I think about what people can really do given the opportunity. And part of our responsibility, the people around this table on either side of Caroline, is to give people that have those kind of disabilities an opportunity to really show that they can make a real difference. And in this case, uh, this young woman has made a real difference. I, yeah, and I met her. And she is, yeah. she is, a, she is a rock star, actually. Absolutely. Um, Carolyn, what's your head heart reason? Head heart. <clears throat> so Carolyn Tasted with Procter & Gamble, and uh, I lead our North American business. And I think similar to my panel, the other panelists here, there are so many reasons from a company business standpoint uh, to make sure we bring equality to life for our, for our people, for our consumers, for all of our stakeholders, uh, and for our business. It's just the right thing to do, and it's, it's good business. I'm not going to repeat what everybody has said. From a business standpoint, we have so many experiences where we have brought uh, people in, and my experience from an interaction with them is that not only do we unlock these incredible skills that they have, as Peter's story and Julie's story outlined, but they have, um, they have, an, they have humanity on steroids. There is an empathy and humanity that is so important for the organization. And so there's, there's something very, very special about it. And I think as all of us are so committed to equality in all of its intersectionality on every level that we're all interested in, uh, I think uh, they can play a very unique role in helping that. And on a personal level, um, you know, my dad lost his hearing when he was in, probably in his early 20s on his left side, not on his right side. Uh, my mom had polio when she was young, so always had limited mobility. And right now is uh, that, you know, the post-polio syndrome is largely uh, mm -hmm. immobile and we're, we're in a wheelchair. Uh, but growing up, we, we saw none of it. Uh, and other than we had to repeat things to dad and mom couldn't find shoes that fit because her feet were different sizes, you know, but that was the extent of any challenge we had. Yeah. And so just coming to understand the, the depth and the, and the, the barriers uh, has been eye-opening. And uh, I think it's really important for business to contribute and help uh, move this forward. Thank you. Um, so we know that this room isn't full, right? Let's call it out. I know it's 5.30 on a Thursday in Davos and we're all exhausted. But I want to ask each of you, what are the, what are the barriers that we can we can take away from business leaders to get this room full next year, actually the biggest room full. What do we think will help leaders come into this room with their eyes open, curious, wanting to know what the opportunity is that exists? Duncan, do you want to, do you want to open up what you think that is? How, how can you unlock that potential in a leader to be part of this conversation? Oh, I think it's the question you started with is a really powerful way of, of, of getting people engaged. So you have to think about this from the business case for doing it, because we're under pressure to deliver numbers every, yeah. every month and every quarter. Yeah. So you have to understand the business case. The great thing about understanding the business case as a leader is it won't just be a tick box exercise. Yeah. Uh, I think Paul's a great example of that. As he leaves Unilever, the commitment to disability carries on because there's a business case for it. And that's what we've been able to do in, Fuji in Fujitsu. And then we have to pull people's heartstrings at the same time. You know, if I look at what we did in Fujitsu seven years ago to get this moving, uh, the first thing was to give our leaders confidence and to feel comfortable about talking about disability. 
You know, it didn't take that long to give people the, the, to feel more comfortable about it. Um, the second part for us was then being able to give our people the confidence that they could say they were disabled. We set up a, a network called SEED. So you can join the network if you happen to be, have a disability or you don't have a disability. Yeah. Um, you know, our people have, have signed up for it. When we first did the network, there were 3% of our employees would identify as having a disability. Um, SEED, by the way, is a, a top 10 global network now. We've got real recognition for it. And as of this morning, 13% of our people identify as being disabled. Not quite at the numbers you need us to get yeah. to yet, but oh. I just think just practical things to bring this to life. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Julie and I were talking about one of the practical, practical things we've done is as we put teams together mm -hmm. to solve clients' problems, it means your manager changes regularly. And there is nothing worse as a disabled person to have to constantly talk to your new manager to say, I need these adjustments. Mm -hmm. I'm disabled, I need these adjustments. Yeah. So we have a disability passport. It's really practical, simple to implement, and your new boss always knows what they need to do. Let me so, jump in yeah, here I was for just, a second. I was going to ask you. Okay. Well, one thing, you know, this was a perfect example of part of what we need to do is that I heard Duncan talk about that, and then I said, hey, can I talk to my team? Because I don't think we're doing that. And I think that really makes a lot of sense. And can we collaborate? Yeah. Right. And so part of what I think we have to do is to have the collaboration so that companies don't feel like they have to start everything from scratch. Yeah. And I know, I know all of the companies here, you know, we are all companies that constantly share. I mean, Duncan was immediately great. You know, we're like, okay, let me check with the team, it'll connect. And I, I think that um, that's a really important part mm -hmm. of helping companies move because to your point, I don't think it's as much about competition, but about the limited resources. And yeah. a lot of times people feel like, I haven't done enough yet here. Mm -hmm. How do I open up? And one of the ways to do that is to have forums like this and to have companies share so that it's easier to move to the next horizon and, and you know, kind of keep moving mm -hmm. down the line across, across diversity. Yeah. And, and I've got to tell you, Julie, by the way, we didn't invent it. I stole it from Lloyd's Bank in yeah. the UK. Yeah, so, yes. So, uh, yeah. You know, we, right. we have a great business yeah, charity right. in the UK called Business in the Community. Yeah. They got a forum together of like-minded business leaders, and we heard this thing from, from the Lloyd's chief operating officer. We kind of were polite. We did ask if we could steal the idea. <laughs> so, and it's just such a well, super simple thing. Well, it's the greatest compliment, thing. right? When somebody steals your idea or a yeah. greatest form of flattery. But I, I have to come clean. Okay. <laughs> so, so I'd like to make a confession. Good. Oh, this is good. Go for it. And this, the confession is the following. In December, I was in London and asked to give a keynote speech for something called Time to Change, an organization called Time to Change, which is disability oriented. And as I was preparing for it, which was several days before, it all of a sudden dawned on me. It was one of these eureka moments. And I said to myself, holy shit, we aren't doing nearly enough. I've been focusing on conventional DNI which I've been championing at the firm and have led for the last five years, but I just haven't thought about disability. And before I made this uh, the keynote speech, a colleague of 35 years in London sent me a message saying, uh, <clears throat> Bloomberg essentially saved my life. And so this kind of dawned on me that we really need to do something different about this. And so we're dramatically accelerating our efforts. But I will say to you that in the four, three days that I've been in Davos, I've talked to major financial institutions, uh, ING being one, Bank of America being another, uh, and um, this afternoon, Standard and Charter being one. And I asked, what are you doing about disability? Thank you. And the response from the three of them was, not enough. We're very much in the early stages. And we are, as leaders in our companies and our communities, doing ourselves a huge disservice by not generating huge energy and effort behind this issue because of the fact that we're all competing for the best talent. We need to have the most workable and people, as we all hear, uh, and we say quite frequently, need to be able to bring their, their whole selves to work every single day so they can maximize their participation and their engagement and the fun that they have at work on a day-in and day-out basis. 
And so, so for us, and, and, and I've subsequently looked, and we're doing actually lots of stuff that I wasn't aware of on the one hand. On the other hand, it takes on a whole new level of visibility because I will try and crack this thing the way I've tried to do it with DNI. You and I are having a conversation after. Yes, um, ma'am. <laughs> uh, Carolyn, the, like Peter has just said it exactly, not enough. We're not right. doing enough. And I can only imagine when you all leaders with profile, you don't want to put yourself into a position where you might be accused of not doing enough. Um, you have led hugely on the issue of gender. And there had to have been a moment when this was exactly the same conversations that were happening within gender, as I'm sure with environment. Can you just kind of reflect on what you learned in that journey? I know we haven't solved it, but as we've made progress, and what you think you can share with other leaders to help get beyond the not enough to even just begin and feel confident mm -hmm. in it. Well, thank you for the question. And as we have thought about this, we've thought about it very similarly to how we thought about gender. And uh, on gender, we've barely made progress. So I'll leave that one for another conversation. Uh, but we think about uh, disabilities very integral to all of our equality work. And we think about it for, as I said before, all of our stakeholders externally, uh, and then also for our stakeholders internally. So externally, it's very much a part of how we think about leveraging our voice in advertising with the media. Uh, Paul and the Unilever team do a great job of this as well. Uh, when a couple of examples, I guess, for our Olympics advertising, we did our love over bias campaign. That was intended to show every different sector, segment of um, diversity and, and trying to work towards equality, whether it was gender, sexuality, income, uh, but also very importantly, um, a, young, a young lad with a prosthetic leg and who was a skier, you know, and it was so important for us to show all of those spectrums uh, because that's what's so critically important. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a Gillette ad, uh, not the one, that, not the one not last that week, one. but I'm happy to talk <laughs> about that as well. That's more on the gender route. But we have one that we have been airing in the US uh, about yeah. Shaquem Griffin, who had um, am amniotic band syndrome, I think I have that right, on his left hand, and his left hand was amputated. But his dream was to play American football. Uh, and through amazing uh, determination and help from his father, uh, he, he, he secured that goal. He, he lived his dream and he's playing uh, American football in the NFL with his brother uh, with, uh, with a, a prosthetic arm. And, and so these things are such important stories to tell because they show the possibilities, they show uh, the potential of these remarkable individuals. And so those are examples of things that we're doing externally, and those are important because we have to, we have to talk about it. Mm -hmm. We have to make it something that everybody thinks about front and center. Uh, and then internally, exactly uh, as, as many of you were saying, we, you know, we have to have the right programs internally for our people, mm -hmm. you know, whether that is employee resource groups, whether that is making our workplace accessible. You know, I hope everybody mm -hmm. visits the exhibit in the, in the main yeah, lobby. Great. It's fabulous. And, uh, and it really shows that when you tackle one of these issues, you can make the environment better for everybody. Absolutely for everyone. And it's I think so that's true. what we have to get at, you know, so making a workplace accessible or having, you know, um, uh, having technology advantages. I mean, there are so many things that will make the workplace better for everybody. So I think that's, that's really important. Well, I think one of the things that we forget is that we're talking about universal design, it's, that's a great point because people forget that the remote control um, that we all are obsessed yeah. with and we use, we're, we're designed yeah. for people like yeah. me, visually impaired and blind people, and we all love them. You know, and I, we forget that SMS right. texting was designed for people who are hearing impaired. Sure. So actually around that piece around the consumer uh, and the consumer part, Paul, I mean, you're one of the, I mean, like Procter & Gamble, you, you speak through your brands to the world and the consumers that exist. Um, how do you see you, you're serving within Unilever the consumers? How are you engaging with the consumer voice and using that power? Because as we said, it's an eight trillion market and that's before we even talk about age. Absolutely. So how, can you just kind of talk a bit to that? Yeah, so the consumer voice I'll get to, but I think what is even more important, and I'm actually happy that uh, the WEF has put it on the program and that you're pushing for it, we need to go well beyond having uh, 
the valuable 500, it should just be the norm for any company as far as I'm concerned. Right. Mm. Yeah. But let's get first through the 500. But it's more than, than the consumer. You need to, if, if you as a company show that you respect, and I'll come back to that, anybody, every individual, I think then also you have the right to, or the better chance as a company to be respected. So whilst we might say, yeah, we, we put uh, tactile information on our packaging or we make the print readable, we make the opening devices better, we adjust our websites, all that might be fine. But I think the overarching thing is that you show that you are a company that cares. You know, it's, it is the business case perhaps, but for me it has never been the business case. Why, why do women have to justify that they should be included in the workforce? You know, men never had to justify it. Uh, why do people with disability have to justify it? Yeah. So making the economic case, I can understand that. There's probably, uh, you know, a need for that for people that have a different level of morality, perhaps. But we shouldn't be able to have to talk that or to defend that. You know, we're living still in a world. I think that there, are, you know, the, there are many people that don't. You know, I don't want to talk disability. By the way, I really use the word disability because I really believe that. We all have uh, different abilities, and it's putting that strength of these different abilities together that, that is important. So if people can see nothing in people than their disabilities, then actually those people are blind mm -hmm. themselves. And that's a very important thing. Or if they cannot hear the cries of everybody to be included, then, then they're deaf themselves. You know, I wonder or, or if they don't stand up for their rights, they're lame themselves. So I think there are many people walking around this world that might not have the visual disabilities, but they are dealing with more disabilities yeah. than many of the people that we're defending here. Yeah. So if we cannot change that mindset, it's, it's a morality issue, not anything else. So what gets in the way is, is awareness in the first place, which is okay, we need to deal with that. I had a dinner in Kenya the other day because anytime I go out, either my wife or myself, we visit the schools for the blind or the deaf blind. So I took uh, 10 or 15 CEOs, and this is a tough environment if you live in these developing markets. But for them, it was a matter of awareness. You know, I didn't know. And then there's often a matter of having access to enough people, even if they want to, yeah. because in these countries, a lot of them is excluded. So companies where it works well is where the CEO is committed, like anything, also on diversity, uh, where there is the willpower, because that's, with many cases in this world, uh, more important than any. And then too many still see it as a cost. We cut, uh, when I was doing the uh, B20 task force for the, uh, for the G20 on food security, at that time in Los Cabos in Mexico, it was the end of the term of uh, Felipe Calderon as president, now, now a good friend. So I said to him, you need to leave a legacy when you leave as president. So uh, I told him, Brazil has probably one of the best laws on disability put a law in place in Mexico. So we got a group of companies together, uh, Mexican companies especially, and he passed a law, bless his heart. But then if you look at it today, many uh, companies have still not implemented it, and you go, and why is this the case? Yeah, we see it as a cost to build a ramp for people to get in a building as a wheelchair is seen as a cost to build a few steps for people that can lift up their legs and, and go into the building is not seen as a cost. It's bizarre to me. Well, you know, there's a piece of, bizarre. I mean, the research is out there that this is kind of shocking that for the, the OECD countries that have quotas around employment, and that's a whole other issue, is the company would rather pay the fine than make the effort to actually bring people with disabilities into the organization. Well, I which think is people like, will. Uh, oh, what can yeah. we do with that? Like, we got to call that out. I like, know. that's yeah. real, right? But if you're a millennial and you want to work for a company now, and millennials are different, they want to look for companies with purpose. I hear so many companies say, oh, they don't want to work anymore for multinationals. No, that's not what they're saying. They're saying, I don't want to work for a company that doesn't have a purpose. You know? Mm. If you, how do you want to work for a company that says, I don't care about a certain group of the people in the population? Uh, exactly. Come on, jump in, because so, I so can't see you all, so jump one in. Of, one of the, we talk about awareness and the importance of raising awareness to this issue. And, uh, you know, and from sharing ideas, one of the things that we did with our entire executive team uh, first of all, let me talk about Samira, you know, our Sam, who is a blind uh, manager in our research and development organization. She's been with us for 18 years and really uh, been at the forefront of a lot of the things that Paul has mentioned, right? Tactile packaging, which isn't just for mm -hmm. blind people, you know? It, it, 
differentiating between the shampoo and the conditioner bottle with soap in your eyes is really important. And so <laughs> there are so many things that make this better. Or shaving for, cream on your teeth. That's sure, another one. Sure, mm -hmm. shaving cream on your teeth. I have done that. Yeah, I have In too. the middle of the night, right? <laughs> You've I won't no say, excuse. Uh, seriously, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was very late, and I was in college. And okay. I'll leave All it right. there. All right. Okay. So, um, <laughs> See, there's so one, much more interesting when we drop the guard. One, but one of the things that becomes so uh, important is people understanding it and getting the dialogue and the awareness. And so what Sam has helped us do in, with our employee resource group is create that experiential moment. And we yeah. took our entire executive team through this, which with headsets that, you know, muffle your hearing with gloves, uh, oh, that it, sim simulate aging or arthritic hands, you know, and then we give them our shampoo bottles and say, open this, or our toothpaste bottles and say, have at it, you know, see how this is. Uh, but we do, uh, we do the same thing. We do gloves, we do that, we do um, glasses, yeah. you know, for sight. Mm -hmm. And just that one moment is incredibly eye-opening for the team. And so we've been doing that and making it available for all of our people. We do it during DNI week, we do it routinely with our brand teams yeah. and our R&D teams. Because you're talking about innovation. And it really fundamentally changes how you think mm -hmm. about innovation. Yeah. I think with anything uh, in this space, with a focus on equality, the more you can integrate it to the yeah. business, the faster we get yes. momentum. Yeah. And so yeah. that notion of innovation, yeah. driving it together, having our research and development teams, our brand teams go through this experience, gives them so many new ideas. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's incredibly helpful. Yeah. Oh. And Carolyn, one of the, I think one of the benefits of being multinationals, Paul, to pick up on a point that yeah. you, you came out with before, is we have the ability to influence our supply chains. You see, this yes. is really important. So, we are not just talking about employment here. We are talking right. about your full value chain, exactly. full so we, supply chain, right? Yeah, so in terms of going to your 500 number, the companies you have here, can, we can take a big chunk out of that by influencing our supply Loving chain. Loving it. For sure. You know, one of my favorite examples on this, one of the, the people in my company who leads really well on this is a guy called Gavin Bounds, and he, uh, took our recruitment people that we use, the third parties we use to supply us with talent. And one particular company said, right, so you need to prove to me you're fishing in diverse pools. Yeah. Really prove. And the, the feedback initially from this person was, I, I can't afford the overhead. Yeah. You know, we're a low margin business. I can't afford the overhead of doing this. Uh, anyway, Gavin managed to convince them, force them, I think was the real term. One year later, the CEO of that company came to us and said, I am so pleased we did it because we've now found it, that's part of our value proposition, we're finding more business. And right. when you get that, it's fantastic. And by taking that approach, our graduate intake every year now, 20% of our graduates would say they have a disability. Which is fantastic that they declare. I mean, I having hidden mine for so long, I know it's a big deal. And actually another piece of research had said that the, of the 7% of C-suite who have a disability, only one in five declare it, because mm. of that oh, fear. Mm. Julie, you've done a huge piece of research with Accenture. Um, actually, there was two pieces to the research, was it, before Christmas? It was quite an extensive piece in the US. Yes. What are some of the findings from that we can learn, like across the supply chain as well? We have to keep getting this just out of employment because it's a much bigger issue. Well, we did research um, called Getting to Equal the Disability Advantage. And what it was really focusing on is, and I agree with you, Paul, we shouldn't have to you know, create a business case, but it is important I believe in terms of, you know, really helping leaders understand is being able to show because there is a business case. And so we did this research because we saw it in our own business and we said, well, let's go out and see whether or not we have facts that show that there is a business case. And so we looked at, we partnered with Disability Inn and the American Association for People with Disabilities, and we looked at the 140 companies that participate in the Disability Equality Index. And what we found was that those who were champions who met the criteria for being leaders had significantly improved financial performance, so 28% higher revenue. They delivered two times the amount of shareholder value. And then we also looked at what the effect on the economy would be if you moved just by 1% yeah. the amount of individuals with disabilities, right? And the effect on GDP was huge. And so, you know, that was a, a part of having a discussion that says there is, in fact, you know, clear business case and numbers. Um, one thing I did want to add, though, is we believe it's really important to be focusing on invisible disabilities as well. And that is a huge portion yeah. yes. of it. And it's really hard. We have a program. It's now in 17 countries. 
uh, creating mental health allies where we educate and aware, make people aware and provide resources. And that's, that's helped immensely. I have a lot of individual cases where it's really changed people's lives because they had people to go to. They were, you know, we were training people on signs of that. And so we focus, it's also helped us then focus on mental wellness, you know, as well. And that, that's, I think, a really important part of this. And some of it, we, we, um, we believe in transparency. And so we started actually in the US putting out our numbers around persons with disabilities, veterans, um, uh, ethnic diversity, and gender diversity. And what we found is, by being transparent, we then started having people be more willing to self-identify because mm -hmm. they felt like we cared. Yeah. Yeah. And so we saw you know, a jump in a year from 3% to 4.5% of people who self-identified. And it wasn't that we'd suddenly you know, hired that, it was the comfort level of people. And we, we you know, continue to see that increase. And so that is another, I think, tool yeah. in terms of helping raise awareness and also help people feel more comfortable. And Peter, like when we talk about the comfort of, you know, declaring or self-identifying, what do you think the role of an organization as Bloomberg, which is about how disability is represented in media, how it's reported on, what do you think your, an organization like yours can be doing to, to support this revolution forward? Well, I, I think uh, I think we could do a lot. Uh, I went back uh, subsequent to the conversation you and I had a week or so ago yeah. <laughs> just to look and see what are we doing, uh, and it's precious little. I mean, I identified, or my team identified, four stories in the last uh, B Bloomberg television interviews on disability, addressing disability in the business world, with an interview with you yeah. from London, which got, <laughs> yeah, I got everywhere. viewership than we've ever had. Uh, uh, how Ernst & Young is tapping into autistic talent. Uh, Margaret Keene, the CEO of Synchrony Financial, talking about hiring disabled workers. Uh, and we also did one with the Microsoft CEO, Satya he Nadella. Yeah. Uh, and Chief Accessibility Officer, Jenny, Jenny. Leigh Fleury, along with her translator, as she is deaf, about building Microsoft's disability group. Uh, so, so we haven't done enough. We can do a lot more. Uh, we have focused our energies a little bit um, on more women on air. And we've done a number of things, including we basically identified now, I think, over 2,000 women who we are basically putting through a training course so that they can feel more confident when they go on air, because they're all experts in their fields and can add, add a huge amount of value. Uh, I'm digressing for just a minute, because I think it's relevant to what we can then do on the disability side. I get a report uh, on a weekly basis from our uh, Bloomberg television people, which identifies every single person that goes on air during the week by uh, whether Caucasian or a person of color, male or female, Bloomberg internal employee or external guest who we've invited in to do that. And so at least the, the team that's booking these knows that I'm looking at this information on a weekly basis and holding them accountable for approving the, the, the numbers, because I think we can do such a better job. But I think in all of this, uh, we can leverage our platforms much more effectively. Uh, and I agree with the, the fact that it's the unidentified disabilities that we can do a much better job. And I've learned through Accenture and other organizations that if we can, like we do with, uh, with unconscious bias, train our people to look for signs particularly our team leaders, which is the first level of leadership in our company, on up, that we can help accelerate the understanding that this is an important issue for us and that we want to be as helpful as we possibly can. Well, can I just firstly applaud your honesty? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for saying it. Yeah. Because actually, you know what? And look, nothing happened. The world didn't all fall down and crumble. Right. Thank you. Thank you for leading with such honesty. I think it's really important. And Peter, I think we, we would <laughs> all you. say yeah. none of us feel like we're no, doing it's... enough. And the way to make sure we're doing more is to have these kinds of discussions right. and having your voice at the table is yeah. so huge. And it's why I really, when you think about the World Economic Forum, 
this is what it's about, yeah. right? A yeah. new topic, a new lens, yeah. leaders like you know all of you, the audience is here, the people watching, this is how we make change. So none of us are doing enough. We're at the very beginning. I will go back to my contacts at ING and the <laughs> head of HR at B of A and at Standard and Chartered uh, in the next week and say, how can we do more together to really figure out how to deal with this problem. You see, I often think, um, you just said it so beautifully, it's, we're here all having an honest conversation. You're talking about your parents, you're talking about not doing enough a childhood experience, what you and Kim are doing, about how you engage with people, about your dad. This is a really human issue, and I think just maybe hopefully today that we're breaking down the fear of not doing enough, which stops us from even just beginning. And I don't think any of us really understand, I know I'm over talking now, but how important, this is the most important panel that will have come out of the World Economic Forum this, this week. It may not be noticed because not this room is full, but that's at the edge of what we are doing. It will never be this difficult again. And having leadership that is talking about it is so important. And one of the things that I, I want to be really clear, when we talk about global disability inclusion, we're not just talking about Europe and North America. Um, and that was a question that was posed in the press conference, right, Paul? And I think some of the work that you've done in Unilever, you're very proud of, is not actually necessarily in Europe or, or the UK. Tell us, because I mean, I think isn't Egypt and Mexico great examples for you that you, you're seeing that kind of So work? Egypt and Mexico would be examples I could take any other country. So now you make me think of those two countries. But you take Mexico, for example. In fact, I met uh, Gina Badenoch when we went out to uh, Mexico. And my wife went out to see things. And she said, there's a lady that does photography with the blind. So that in itself is something that you want to see. And, um, and so she has an NGO called uh, Ojos Que Sienten, Eyes That Feel. And she had uh, worked with a lot of the blind people there. So we brought them in touch with our company. I've never made this a part of Unilever because I didn't want to compromise as a CEO my position there. But soon they, they saw the power of these people and they started embracing it. And now with that organization, we've prepared, which is a very important part, to make an organization ready also to deal with that, get the biasness out of recruiting and all the things that come with it. And uh, so now they have hired, I think, 10 or 12 people. And one of them, uh, Oscar, who is uh, uh, deaf. No, sorry, he's uh, mute. So, um, but he can, read, he can read your lips, so you don't even notice it. So we made him actually, we put him in charge of uh, disability globally. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of hiring about 8,000 people globally, which I've always seen as the best retirement present for me when I move on now. Um, and he's in charge, so that's a Mexican. In Egypt, the lady was also very uh, passionate about uh, people with uh, visual impairment, and uh, they hired over 20 uh, blind people. We have two, um, two of them teaching English in the factories, for example. We have uh, people on the phone doing phone sales, uh, tremendous jobs. We have people in R&D. And when I was there last, about two years ago, they said, uh, I was giving my town hall or something, and they said, you know, we have a present for you, which is something that we don't like, and it's always embarrassing because at the end, they are the heroes. But the present was that two of the blind people uh, actually had decided to get married, and they wanted to announce it, but I was there. Hmm. So, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> so that's, then you know that life is good, so. Um, you just need more. You're going to make me cry, so... Uh, and, We're all and, crying. Yeah, I know. <laughs> can I just say, is that such a bad thing that we have emotion and heart? Um, it, it reminds me very much about why I'm here is because uh, Paul was the very first leader who stood up for disability business inclusion. Um, and look what has happened. So how do we fill this room again? And one thing I want to come back to before I ask each of you to close, um, before we're all crying, is um, actually with happiness too, is Duncan, you're working, as you said, with a global company and you've been talking a lot of what happens in the UK. Mm. Now, I'm, I'm just asking, how can you 
spread that best practice that's in the UK right throughout the organization? Or what is the reality of that in Fujitsu, for example? Are they doing the same great job you're doing in the UK right across the board? So we've, uh, we've taken what we've learned in, in the UK on, on the topic. Uh, and I, and I must give one organization a lot of credit, which is business in the community, because they yeah. have helped inform us what a responsible business looks like across the board. So although I'm talking about disability today, we like to think about we're running the whole company responsibly, but disability is one, is one part of it. And then what we've done is, is we've taken what we've done in the UK, and that's the framework that we have. So now if you look at what uh, we would say it as a global company headquartered in Japan, if you look at the pillars that we have in place for the way we think about responsible business, it's based upon what we've, what we've done in the UK. So, and this, I think, is the real power of mm. a company that... Question. I mean, Japanese companies feel very responsible for society, full, full stop. stop. yeah, yeah. Mm. And, but it just shows you the power of being in a global organisation like ours, yeah. what we can do about spreading it around the world, and I think the really important thing is influencing our supply chains. Love it. Yeah, Love it. It's a good point. So listen, guys, we have, um, I have the ear telling me we are just to close up. Um, I would like to ask each of you, fabulous leaders, um, Peter's kind of said it already, but I'd love to hear it again. What are each of you going to do uh, to spread this message, I think? Um, and what would you ask our audience here in the room and our audience online? What is it that each of you would do personally and ask our colleagues to do to ensure that this is going to be a much bigger conversation in a much bigger room with much more action this time next year at Davos. And I'm going to start with you, Julie. Well, we're going to continue to advocate through, you know, the research that we've done and talking about it and having our leaders go out and importantly continuing to act. So we have an action plan ourselves. And the one, I want to actually give some practical advice. So like Duncan, we look at country by country around the same criteria. But one of the things we've found is that in many countries, there actually are laws. And then what happens is the local people only work to the law, which is usually like far below Great what point. we really need to do. And so if you are a leader that's new to this, and you know, one of the important questions to ask is, you know, really understand, well, when you say you're complying with law, does that really seat the standard and really probe in that? Because a lot of times the first answer was, no, no, we're fine. But that's because it was viewed by compliance as opposed to a talent strategy, a business imperative. And so as a leader, you really have to learn to ask the right questions. That's my practical advice. Thank you. Peter. I'm going to go last. You're going to go last. I love that you're not going to do as you're told. Who wants to go Here next, go. in case I, I tell anybody what to do? Unless I'm happy to go Carolyn, next. I'm happy what, to go your, next. What are, you, what are you going to do, and what are you challenging the world out there, leaders, to do? So, like Julie, we're going to continue to make this an integral part of our total equality strategy. So speaking about it externally to all of our stakeholders, consumers, uh, retailers involving them, but certainly the stakeholders internally as well, because it's equally as important to our employees. So we will continue to do that. We're going to continue to invest internally, uh, whether it is, you know, for 10 years we've had disabled uh, teens and adults coming in to skill train, uh, but we're also investing in a neuroscience center in Costa Rica, also in the U.S., to work with uh, people who identify with on the autism spectrum. Like, so there's so many wide ranges of things that you can do, and we will continue to do all of that. I, I think for me personally, and I think the opportunity, which Julie mentioned and you did as well, the opportunity to do more on invisible okay. disabilities, I think, is so important. And I think continuing to provide room for that dialogue and that discussion with great intentionality, I think, is going to be important. That, that will be my personal one. Thank you. Can I just point out that we may be running out of time, and I do have something. You're coming. We're nearly there. there, Peter. I just want Duncan. to make sure. I, I haven't got the whisper in my ear. I mm. promise you. I know I can't see, but okay. they're keeping an eye on me. Is this where I say I want to go last? No, because yeah. he's going no, last. No, that's so place you been taken. <laughs> so look, um, we have so much more to do, as as business in general, and I know in Fujitsu we have. You've much got more five to do. minutes. You're good, Peter. The thing, the thing for you, you are fantastic, and what you're doing with the fabulous 500, it, you deserve an enormous amount of praise and recognition. Yes. For doing that. 
Yeah. Oh, great. We're not allowed great, to talk great, about great. that. So uh, I, it needed saying. Um, the second thing I'd say... You called it the fabulous 500, by the way. Yes, yeah, sorry. It's the valuable 500. Yeah, I'm go. loving the fabulous 500. <laughs> <laughs> and they're fabulous. Thank, yeah, thank and you for fabulous. correcting me. I think for people who are watching this, take the first step. Get your leaders confident in disability and set up a network. They're really easy things to do. You could do them next week. Thank you. And then the Thank final you. thing I'd say is, I'm going to take a target. So we will take a target as Fujitsu to get people enlisted in the 500. Um, you can probably going to frown at me. No, I'm not. I'm just we'll, smiling my we'll, head off. We'll get 20 people. We'll get 20 deal. companies to sign up. Good deal. Thank you very much. Best friend ever. So all I would say is that uh, people with disabilities uh, are also human beings, and it could be you tomorrow. Yes. So the valuable 500 campaign you can be incredibly proud of and the WEF we should be very grateful for if anybody has seen the exhibit or if you haven't seen it yet, go to the exhibit, look at the bench, there's a mental bench for just having the conversations. There are uh, panels like this, so we should be grateful for the WEF in a world that is pretty messed up to give something that is more important, uh, this, um, this podium. And I think after this panel, we just have made it a mistake to call it the valuable 500. You can certainly count on me for the valuable 5,000. That's how we should be. We're here. OK, beat that, Peter. You have two minutes and counting. Uh, I have three things to say. Uh, number one, what we're going to do is we're going to basically uh, our internal education program on people with disabilities is going to get ramped up dramatically, and all of our managers are going to go through it in 2019. The second thing I will say is I will not stop proselytizing amongst my peers that this is an important issue. The third thing that I want to say, uh, which is entirely separate from anything that I've said to date, and that is Paul Pullman is probably the single most influential chief executive officer on issues around climate, and diversity and inclusion of anyone that has led a company in the last 10 or 15 years. That is uh, beautifully said. So we're coming to the end, and I'm going to take the last word. God bless, that's not unusual. Um, thank you. Thank you, World Economic Forum. Thank you for all those people who for years and decades have waited for a moment for disability business inclusion to take centre stage. This is not the only answer, but it is a very, very important part of the jigsaw piece. I have huge admiration for the five of you. You are fabulous leaders anyway, but to have your voices. And I actually want to just thank each of you slowly. Julie, thank you so much. And Accenture, thank you so much. Peter, thank you so much. And Bloomberg, thank you so much. Carolyn, thank you so much. And Procter and Gamble. Duncan and Fujitsu. Paul Pope and Unilever. Let's fill this room full to the brim next year. Thank you very much. <laughs>